Good day, this is Jim Patel from Columbia Gorge Community College Renewable Energy Technology Program. This is EET 122, Digital 2. Today we're going to have a quick discussion about the troubleshooting section in the book, and then we'll finish up with the timing circuits for the traffic control system application activity. Okay, so regarding the troubleshooting there, just go ahead and read that. It has a uh, quick discussion about glitches there, and all it has to do with something is a the design of a circuit, you know, in this particular circuit, it's just one example of previously they had a high, uh, excuse me, a uh, positive edge detection device, which unfortunately was you were ending these two inputs together, and what was happening, you're having this brief period where they're simultaneously in this transition period. Well, how the design got around that, all they did was just use negative edge triggering because that way we can avoid that region of simultaneously um, being in a transition. So depends on what this signal is doing right here, whether you choose a positive edge flip-flop or a uh, negative edge device. Pretty quick, easy discussion. Uh, and again, it uses a logic analyzer there, wicked, which can detect those rapid changes. It's almost like an oscope. It's just got a means of detecting those rapid spikes, those super quick spikes. But I digress. We're going to talk about the traffic signal control with the time circuits. OK, remember way back when, at the end of the last chapter, we talked about this timing. Uh, excuse me, the traffic signal control. So if you're not familiar what was going on then, either go back and watch that big long video again or just listen to what I have to say. All it is, we got to figure out a means of making a 25 second timer, a four second timer, and I think it's a 10 kilohertz clock signal. Okay, so we want a four second timer, a 25 second timer, and for the purposes of this lecture, let's just make a 20 kilohertz timer, OK? So what are these guys? These guys are one shots. So monostable multivibrators. This guy, that's a clock. And that's an A-stable multivibrator. OK, there's two ways we can do this. We can use a dedicated one-shot device or we can use a general purpose 555. And we'll do both of them, just for examples purposes. Um, so this one, we got to use a 555 timer for that. But these guys, we can use, let's do the 74121, so that's the one you guys use in lab, and a 555. OK, so which one do you want to do first? I don't care what you want to do. I want to do the 4 second 74121 first. So four seconds. We got to make a timer that's four seconds long using the 74121. So just go ahead and look up your data sheet for the 74121 uh, for a resistor external and capacitor external, and what is the pulse width? Well, the formula. Uh, excuse me. The formula for the pulse width, Tw, is equal to 0.7 R external times C external. So we want to make one that is four seconds long. So let's just grab a 10 microfarad capacitor out of the box, just starting with, with something. you got to start somewhere. Four seconds, 0.7. What's my R external that I need? Well, do the math. Our external should be 571.4 kilo ohm resistor. Is there really such a thing as a 571.4 kilo ohm resistor? No, there isn't. There's a standard resistor values, and the closest one you can get is a 560 kilo ohm resistor. So, is that going to do us good? 0.7. 560K times 10 microfarads. Close enough. 3.9 seconds. Good to go. If you wanted to, you really could add 
a 10K plus a 1K plus a 400 ohm resistor in series with that, making your R external 571.4 kilo ohms. You know, or you could find some exotic capacitor and pay a lot of money for it, but 3.9 seconds, that's good enough for me. That's real close to four seconds, and that was what we wanted our yellow light to be. Okay, doing the same thing for a 25 second timer. Again, 0.7 R external times, and I'm going to say 2.2 .2 microfarads. Now, so let's do the math and figure out how close of R external do we need to get. And doing the math, your R external should be on something on the order of 16 mega ohms. Well, 16.23 mega ohms but there really is no such thing as a 16.23 mega ohm resistor but there is a 16 mega ohm resistor so are we close yeah we are it's 24.64 seconds so that's close enough 25 seconds okay so why did i choose the 74 121 as opposed to the 74122. So, what's the difference between the two guys? 74121, non-retriggerable. For the purposes of this application, you would want a non-retriggerable one-shot because, let's say for example, if a, a car is sitting at the side straight and, and it's gone, but then right at the very tail end, it, another car shows up but you want it to only last for 25 seconds, well, the arrival of that second car, if you were using a retrievable one-shot, would simply extend the pulse width. That's not what we're, that's not what we're looking for. We wanted a non retrievable Okay, the other thing about the 74121 is what is your trigger? Okay, remember from our lab, we could set this up in a bunch of different ways. We could do uh, low level logic, high level logic, uh, negative edge, positive edge, a bunch of different ways to do in the 74121 to trigger it. But now, 555. How do you trigger a 555 set up as a one shot? Because okay, so that's active low. So that's the other thing you need to consider. Like here's my signal here and it goes down. That is my trigger event right there when it's low for a 555. That's the only way to do it. 74, 121, positive edge, negative edge, high, low, any way you want to. So they're a little bit more flexible. 74, 121 as a one shot device, a little bit more flexible than the 555. You could do logic leading up to the trigger event. You know, let's say, well, in our examples, I think it, uh, the states were state one and three, that the, no, let me think, state two and four were our yellow light conditions there. So state two and four, um, you know, when state two and four are on, we want to have a yellow light going. Well, we need a active low trigger. So you either not state two or not state four to get that active low. So it's just showing you again another example, 74121. It's a special, that's its only purpose in life. It's a one shot, and it's going to do it a lot better than a general purpose device like the 555. But while we're talking about the 555, let's go ahead and set up the 555 for a four second one shot. Okay, again, setting up the 555 as a one shot device, we're going to tie our threshold and discharge together and we're going to put a capacitor there put that to ground and put our single external resistor right here tie that to plus five plus five now our trigger it's got to be it's got to drop down to low for us to have this pulse of our in this particular case, four seconds. Okay, so what's R external and C external 
for 555 set up in this manner. Okay, so it should be a pretty familiar formula. It's actually very much it's just 1.1 R1 C1. So what we're going to do is let's pull a again let's pull a 10 microfarad capacitor out of the drawer. We want it to be four seconds. What's our R external or R1 C1 doesn't matter what you call them. What is this guy? I'll do the math. Our external should be 363.3 kilo ohms. We don't really have that, but we do have a 360 kilo ohm. So, what is it with a 360 kilo ohm? Answer is 3.96 seconds. Very, very close. Okay, so let's do another, the 25 second one. Okay, we want to set up again 1.1 our external, C external, and we want it to make it equal to 25 seconds. And just for the heck of it, let's solve for the capacitor. Okay, so we have, let's look up a standard resistor value. I'm just going to do 750. 50k. So I give you a 750k. What is the capacitor that you need for a 25 second one shot? And you get an answer of something like 30.3 microfarads. That's not a standard capacitor value. Uh, I think your closest standard capacitor value is 33 microfarads. It goes from 22 microfarads to 33 microfarads. Um, and I don't know why it just does that. But there is no 30. So you got to pick the closest one. I would pick the 33 microfarads. So now with 1.1 750k times 33 microfarads, what do we get? 2723 seconds. So that to me, no, I don't think I would do that. I would probably go back and figure this guy here, um, drop him down a little bit, take a uh, 680 or something, see if I can get a capacitor um, that's a little bit closer to either a 22 or a 33. Uh, so this is basically just showing you that pick one element to find the other one and if it's not close just go back and pick another one okay and it's also showing you as the 555 here is yours in 1.1 as opposed to r74 121 is a 0.7 okay so the last problem oh yeah i'm gonna leave this as an exercise for you no we already did it we already did the four seconds and the 25 seconds for the 555 Actually, no, here I'll do, leave this for you. What's the closest standard resistor value you can get using a 33 microfarad capacitor to get it close to 25? Try to get it a little bit closer. Okay, let's do the last portion of the exercise, and that was this. We want a 10 kilohertz clock. So now we just set up a 555 timer as a a stable oscillator, i.e. a clock. So how do you go ahead and do that? Well, first thing you do, tie your threshold and trigger together, and then you're going to put that to a capacitor, CEXT, external capacitor. And remember, it's going to discharge to one resistor. So that's going to be hooked up there, and it's going to charge through two resistors. If you want to get super fancy, yeah, you can put a diode here. But we're not going to do that for this one. Okay, so we want 10 kilohertz. It doesn't really matter um, whether our duty cycle is a 50% or a 
a 25% or for that matter 75% as long as we get something that's occurring on a 10 kilohertz beat we're good to go okay um, unless there's something stringent where it requires a 50% duty cycle or a 25% duty cycle or a 75% duty cycle unless there's something explicitly stating that all you want is just a 10 kilohertz signal so let's figure out the values for R1 R2 and C external to make a 10 kilohertz signal okay so remember from the 555 setting up the 555 timer as a a stable oscillator remember time high is 0.7 R1 plus R2 C external because it's charging up through two resistors time low is equal to 0.7 R2 CXT because it's discharging through a single resistor and T is equal to TH excuse me period is equal to time high plus time low and so frequency is equal to 1 over T so you should be like oh this is going to get complicated okay because for every value I mean just let's let's do it let's what is the formula for frequency frequency is 1 over 0.7 r1 plus r2 c external plus 0.7 R2 C external and you're telling me I've got to pick three components to get 10 kilohertz well it's substantially easier than that there's this graph looks something like this where frequencies on the bottom capacitor is the uh, the vertical and these lines here represent different combinations of R1 plus R2. This is the way to cheat to do this. Yes, you could do this thing right here and simultaneously the linear equation and solve it, but that's not going to be easy. All you do, find your frequency here, and this is inside your data sheets too. Find your frequency, 10 kilohertz, and go up where it intersects a line it doesn't matter which which line it is let's take this one right here where it intersects the 1k line that means r1 and r2 whoops excuse me 1 kilo ohm equals r1 plus 2r2 i forgot that last lecture i'm not going to forget this lecture so these lines, again, these blue lines represent R1 plus 2R2. So we've walked up, we've found a particular combination that we like, 1K, and read what the capacitance value is. In this particular case, it's between 0.1 and 1, and let's just say um, let's say let's get a close number here one second and because that's a logarithmic scale let's just say it's 0.33 microfarads just start there see external we're going to start at 0.33 microfarads since we're using the 1k line let's go ahead and uh, make our combination of r1 plus 2r2 1k and see how close we are we're not going to be exact because again we're just kind of reading off of that range right there so let's see what we get here yeah i revealed it already so i was going to wait to the end but i kind of spoiled it but so you answered that last one if you gave a if it was previously what was it it was we were looking for yeah we had a 750 we were looking for a capacitor and we found 30 but we the closest one we could get was 33 
If you use a 680K resistor, which is the next standard resistor value down, you get 24.6 seconds, which is your um, close enough for 25 seconds. But I digress. We were working here before I revealed the secret answer uh, about the frequency of 10 kilohertz. Is it close to 10 kilohertz? Let's figure it out. And the answer is not even close, OK? So I just guessed earlier. So again, what's our formula for frequency? 1.44 R1 plus 2 R2 C1. And if we kept that at 1,000 ohms or 1K, and we put in our value of 0.33 here, what you get, I think, is like 4.3 kilohertz. Not even close. So how are we going to change that? Well, we want this number to go bigger. So what are we going to do here? Go smaller there. And just for the heck of it, let's do... That's 1,000. I haven't changed that. Let's go down to the... Let's go down to 0.15 microfarads. And what do we get here? We get... 9.6 kilohertz. Okay, we're getting closer. So now what are we going to do here? Let's drop that just a little bit. Let's do that 900. That's too much. Let's do um, 980. Let's do 980. Too shy. At 980, we're still getting 9.796 kilohertz. So that's again, that was that was 980. Let's drop it again to 960. So 1.44, 960 times 0.15 microfarads. And we get, well, 10 kilohertz, nice. So you see what I'm saying is, this gets you a starting, uh, a starting range here. Uh, you start off here, you can do this a number of different ways. Let's say you want to use a capacitor of a certain value, and then you can just read it back this way. What's the resistance that so happens to coincide, let's say, for example, 5 kilohertz? OK, so um, one last thing to say about this. Oh, yes, keep in mind, that's R1 plus 2 R2. It does not matter how you uh, arrange these guys as long as that is equal to 960. Your duty cycle can fluctuate, though, by making R1 or R2 bigger or smaller. OK? So let's just pick, um, let's see, uh, let's make R2, uh, let's see, uh, 80. So if R2 is 80, What's my R1 going to be? R1 should be 800 ohms. OK, how is that affect our duty cycle? Time high, time low. So time high, remember, is, where is it? It is right here. It's charging up through two resistors. 0.7, R1 plus R2, C external, time low, 0.7, R2, C external. So what we get, time high is going to be 92.4 microseconds, time low, 8.4 microseconds. So does this add up? to the correct period, first off. That's the question you should be asking yourself. So TH plus TL should be equal to the required period for T. And that is going to, if we do the do the numbers here, it's 100 microseconds, almost 100 microseconds. What is the period for a 10 kilohertz wave? 100 microseconds. So we're check, kind of checking your work to begin with. But now, have we created something 
with a big duty cycle or a small duty cycle? Well, time high, it's 92 seconds, excuse me, 92 microseconds and only eight microseconds long, uh, low. Okay, so what we've created is basically a 92% duty cycle. Okay, what if you wanted to create um, something smaller than that? Well, we've got to go ahead and play around with R1 and R2. Again, keeping that combination equal to 960. And just for the heck of it, let's do something. It's still going to be equal to 960. But let's just do something totally crazy. Let's make R1 let's make that one 60. So that by extension means R2 is 450. So what's our duty cycle now? It's still gonna be it's still gonna be 10 kilohertz. We should still have a wave of 10 kilohertz, but what's our duty cycle now? Well, TH. TL. Okay, again, you're charging up through two, discharging through one. And what do we get here? And what you get using this combination here, time high, 53 microseconds, time low, 47 microseconds. So, 53 on, 43 off, Oops, excuse me, 47 off, and so on and so forth. Almost 50% duty cycle, more appropriately, it's 53% duty cycle. Say you want an exact, and since we're beating this dead horse, let's really, really make sure it's dead. Why not? Where is my diagram? Let's make sure it's super, super, super dead, this horse. Let's put a diode in there. And let's make it exactly 50%, this guy right here. How do you do that? Make R1 and R2 equal to each other. Because now we are charging up through one resistor. Let's go back and see how that diode functions, because remember, it's just going to go that way. And we're discharging through one resistor only. So R1, 480, R2, 480. This guy gives us something like, well, certainly hope. 50 microseconds high, 50 microseconds low through the addition of that one diode. Okay, so all this uh, system application activity really did, it really didn't even talk about the stuff we had previously generated besides the, uh, the trigger logic, which I discussed regarding the 74.121 right here versus the 555. We didn't even really uh, refer to the traffic diagram, uh, traffic signal, control circuit. All we referred to is 5, 25, and 10 kilohertz. But what this was was just a big long example of how to set up a 74121 as non-retriggerable one shots of 4 and 25 seconds. Same thing for 555 as a 4 and 25 and the 555 as an A-stable multivibrator for a 10 kilohertz clock cycle. All right, we are moving on.